Everybody, everybody ready? Yeah. Ready to get the book? Ready to get the word? Amen. Yes. All right, so let's do let's go to Deuteronomy chapter eleven. Deuteronomy chapter eleven. I don't know where this water magically appeared, but I'm grateful for it. Deuteronomy chapter 11, um, if you're a guest with us, we're glad that you're here. Uh, we get the, uh, the Seamers family from uh, Midtown is, uh, is here with us this morning. We got some other guests here. We're really grateful to have you all. Uh, again, if you're on the live stream, hey, we love you guys. We miss you, and we look forward to seeing you very, very soon. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's interesting, the times that we live in, the... Uh, the uh, how much times like these cause people to think in spiritual terms, right? Um, I can't even tell you how many how many spiritual conversations I've been able to have with people who normally want to talk about the weather, or they want to talk about football, or they want to talk about sports. And I'm down to talk about the weather, football, the sports all day long. I'm down to talk about those things. But really, um, people are really interested in, in in spiritual things, right? And I say spiritual things because that's that's usually what that means, not necessarily biblical things, right? Spiritual things, not necessarily biblical things. And man, what an opportunity we have as individual believers and as a church um, to reach a world who has a lot of questions, right? Who are scared or, or thinking about um, thinking about illness or thinking about death. I, I don't know if there's anybody here that doesn't at least know somebody who has COVID or has passed away from COVID or something along those lines. So um, it, it is on our doorstep that the reality um, COVID is not what we were scared of, right? That is not it's not not to be not to be feared, it's to be understood. And uh, the reality is there are people who are dying and going to hell. I mean that's the hell. And what are we doing to get the gospel out? And not only that, what are we doing? to make sure there's a generation that follows us who has the same one. Because we are going to reproduce ourselves. Amen, church? We always, you reproduce yourself. That's what you do. You reproduce yourself, then that's not always a good thing. Everybody understand that? That's not always a good thing. We're supposed to be reproducing our walk with God into, in, into another generation. And so that's what I want to really address here in chapter 11, we're only going to get to verse 9, I think, um, today. But I want to start in chapter 10, um, specifically in verse 22. Um, I, I think we have to take verse 22 to give us a running start into the rest of this chapter. And uh, Dave did a great job. I went back and listened to the message twice um, just to make sure I, I got it all and wrote my notes down. And verse 22 says this. Is everybody there say amen? Amen. Thy fathers went down into Egypt with three score and ten persons. And now the Lord thy God hath made thee as the stars of heaven for multitude. So as Moses is standing there, he's talking to this, this, this nation of Israel, right? Standing on the water's edge, getting ready to cross over this promised land. He's talking to a large amount of people. We're talking hundreds of thousands of people. And yet just prior to that, 400 and some years prior to that, there was only 70 of them that went down into Egypt. And there's hundreds of thousands that come out of Egypt. And what that lets us know is there's an expectation of reproduction. Amen? There's an expect. Everybody with me this morning? Yeah. There's an expectation of reproduction. And uh, so if I could just give you two main points today. right? This is going to be a super simple message right across the planet. I know I say that all the time. We are going to do a little bit of flipping. We are going to look at a couple of scriptures, but I'm, I'm really praying that, that these are just two simple handles you can walk out of here with um, and, and maybe change the perspective of your life forever. And, and the first one is simply this. You're here because another generation was. Did you know that? The reason that you were able to sing songs to the Lord, the reason that you have the Bible in your, in your possession, the reason that you have access to God's word is because the generation before you said that was important. Important to get it translated into your language. Important enough that they laid their lives down. You understand that you are here today seated in this building. Some of you because there was a generation before us doing this thing. Serving the Lord, making disciples. Praise the Lord for that, amen? I'm thankful for the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ who have gone before us, who have done great exploits. 
exploits for the Lord, and God has used them mightily. I'm, I, I'm thinking of the, the Moravians who sold themselves into slavery to reach slaves for Christ. People like that who went before us to, to just, just pour, their, pour their heart out and pour their lives out for, for others. And what you see here in verse 22, he says, Thy fathers, it's a previous generation. Thy fathers went down into Egypt with three score and ten persons. Old English speak for 70. All right? Everybody with me? And three score and ten, ten persons, and now the Lord thy God hath made thee as the stars of heaven for multitude. Now, I think that's interesting because he's not, when he's talking to the nation of Israel at that moment, it's not like they're as the stars of heaven for multitude, but they will be. They're well on their way to become that. No, for sure. And God is still carrying out this promise um, today. And so I want you to just notice a couple things here. That we're here because the generation before us was. That means that they had to go down into Egypt. They had to be willing to go down into Egypt. Now what is Egypt? David shared this last week. What's Egypt the picture of? The world. It's the world. Right? And so they, they chose to go down into Egypt. You can't see it. And so how many of you are here because somebody went down into Egypt to get you, to find you, because that's where you were born and raised. That's where you were from. You're from the world. Whether it was a vacation Bible school or, or a youth group that you got invited to or a Bible study or somebody had a, a conversation with you in the workplace or you were raised up in the church and it was a children's, it was a Sunday school teacher who poured the word of God into you, went into your Egypt to find you. Understand that? I wouldn't be here if it hadn't been for somebody going to Egypt and rescuing me. And sharing the name of Jesus Christ. And sharing the gospel with me. Somebody stood long before you were here to make a disciple who led you to Christ. You understand that? That we have to think generationally. And that's the message I have. Think generationally. We have to think generationally. We have to put other generations on our, on our mind. Remember where we came from, no doubt about it. Um, but understand, who's following us? If the Lord tarries, do you understand that this generation is going to die? That we're going to go on? And there better be another generation to follow? There has to be another generation to follow, guys. That's our job uh, to accomplish that. Now, he says, thy fathers went down into Egypt, here in verse 22, chapter 10, verse 22. Thy fathers went down into Egypt with three score and ten persons. Look at this. And now the Lord thy God hath made thee as the stars of heaven for multitude. So not only did they go down to Egypt, but they also chose to reproduce their walk with the Lord in another generation. It wasn't enough just to go down into Egypt, but they multiplied there. Bear with me? Is it too hot in here? Can you all sleep? All right, so they, they went down and they, and they multiplied there. They, they chose to reproduce their walk with God into this, this generation that Moses is talking to. They are the generation, the product of the generations that went before them into Egypt. Now, there's a, there's a few practical applications I want to make here. So hold your spot and go to John, John chapter 17. John chapter 17. This is what I refer to as the Lord's Prayer. This is his prayer uh, before he's betrayed. This is his prayer uh, before he goes to the cross and he's laying out to the Lord. He's, he's saying, yeah, I've, I've made disciples. I've poured my heart out. I've, I've given them the word of God. And now I'm sending them out in the, way that, the way, in the way that you sent me. And so let me just give you four practical applications just out of verse 22. Very fast. The first one is this. There's fruit in Egypt, but you have to be willing to go there to get it. There's fruit in Egypt, but you have to be willing to go there to get it. In John chapter 17, in verse 18, Jesus says, As thou hast, he's talking to God the Father, he says, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Okay, get this. So, Pastor David made mention of this last week. That we are to be separated from the Lord, or from the world. Don't be separated from the Lord. Don't do that. We are to be separated from the world, but not isolated from it. I love that he made that point. You can't isolate yourself from the world. Why? Because that's where the fruit is. That's where the lost are, right? That's where you have to go to, to be there. So there is fruit in Egypt, but you have to be willing to go there and get it out. In chapter 10, verse 22, he says, they went down to 70, come out 
that as hundreds of thousands. Now, this is important again. Some of them were excited. The majority of them were excited to get out of Egypt, but there, was, there were a few that couldn't wait to go back to the world. They couldn't wait to go back into Egypt. So what does that tell me in a practical, practical sense? Well, listen, believers today, there are a whole lot of believers who are just kicking in Egypt. They're just chilling. They're just hanging out in Egypt. But there are a few who are killing. I'm telling you. There are a few who are, who are leading people to Christ. They're sowing the, sowing the seed of the gospel. They're watching God give the increase. And they're making disciples and they're reproducing their walk with God and somebody else. But I'm just telling you, there, there's a host of believers who are comfortable in Egypt. And they're just chilling. The reason God sends us into the world is to bring bear fruit. And what you see here in John chapter 17, he says, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so I have also sent them into the world. But somewhere along the line, Christians started building their own little bubble. They're going to have their Christian business, they're going to have their, their Christian this, and their Christian this, and their Christian this, and their script. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But what the problem is, is sometimes that isolates you from where the fruit is. Everybody with me on that? There's a tendency to be isolated. God says, no, 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 I'm sending you into the world. But that's right, you're saving from it. That's right, you're no longer of it. Now I'm sending you into it to make an influence, verse 19. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. And listen, the idea is that you, you go into the world not to, be, not, not to be influenced by the world, but sanctified in it, verse 19. And for their sakes, I sanctify thy, thyself, myself that they also may be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone. He's talking about his 12 disciples. He's talking about his 70. He says, but for them also who shall believe on me through their word. You understand that? This is Jesus' generation. He gives it to these disciples, and they take that generation, and they lead others to the Lord. You understand that? They turn the world upside down. Acts chapter 17 talks about how just a few turn the world absolutely upside down. He's praying for you and he's praying for me. He says, through their word, verse 21, that they may all, sorry, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, unity. Why? That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Father, you, you sent me. Of sending forth the disciples in the same way that you sent me. Why? Because their disciples are going to go reach the world. Jesus was thinking generational, wasn't he? He was putting things, he was even in his prayer, he was praying for you and he's praying for me. That blows my mind. That we are here because these disciples are faithful. These disciples, and they were faithful. And they trickled down for a couple thousand years. And here we are singing praises to God about the well who won't run dry, about the God who leads me. Why, Jesus loves me. That is what we're able to say, because it was a generation prior to us that said, I'm willing to go down to Egypt. I'm willing to lead people to Christ. I'm willing to make a disciple, and I want to see it multiply. All right, so the first thing, the practical was that there's fruit in Egypt, and you have to be willing to get it. The second practical point is there's some believers who are kicking it in Egypt, but there's... There are some who are, who are absolutely killing it there. Praise the Lord for that. Here's the next thing. If you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 10, just for a moment, verse 22, thy fathers went down into Egypt with three score and ten persons, and now the Lord thy God hath made thee. You see, you see that? It was God who did the work, right? It was God who gave the increase. And so that's the third point. God gives the increase, but you have to be willing to plant and water in faith. God has, God's the one that gives the increase, no doubt about it. But you have to be willing to plant and to water in faith. You know where we're going. First Corinthians chapter 3, you know that. Let's go there. First Corinthians chapter 3. If you didn't know it, now you do. First Corinthians chapter 3. That's where we're going to be. First Corinthians chapter 3, look with me in verse, verse 4. He says, But while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom he believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God, what? What does it say? Gave the increase. So Paul says, man, all I'm doing is, is planting, and Apollos is, is watered, but it's God who gives the increase. You, you can't escape that. It's inescapable. 
changeable. Verse 8, now he that planteth and he that waters are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. So what's the responsibility of this generation, this, this old generation? You know what they did? They just went to Egypt, and they, they poured their heart out, and they shared the gospel, and they made disciples, and they trusted God with the rest. This got busy doing what they could do. Listen, you know what? I'm, I, I can't worry what David Williams is going to do. I, I can't worry about what Alex Matthews is going to do. I've got to do what I'm told to do. I'm going to go into Egypt. I'm going to lead people to Christ. And, and I'm going I'm to trust that God's going to give the increase and see it multiply. That's it. That's absolutely it. That's our job, and we've got to do it in faith. Which tells, me, tells us here's the fourth application. God prefers multiplication over addition. God prefers multiplication over addition. Now, I was going to do an example, but because we have a lot of people online and we're not able to, to do it, I was going to have everybody who has been discipled to stand up. Please don't do that now. But I'm going to have you stand up. And then I was going to have, if you had been discipled, stand behind the person who had discipled you. And what we would love to see is that there would be generations of disciples. And then I was going to have, if you are being disciple, stand behind the person who is disciple. <laughs> it would be an eye opener to see the tree, wouldn't it? And just be eye opener. And yet, you know what? There's going to be some who said, you know, stand up, and there's not going to be anybody behind them. Then let me just encourage you think generation. Think generation. You don't want your line to end with you, don't let it end with you. There's got to be another generation. All right, so quickly, let's go to chapter 11. That was message number one. Ready for message number two? Message number two. Chapter 11, verse one. He says, therefore, thou. You see that? It makes it very singular, doesn't it? In, in verse 22 of the, of the previous chapter, he's talking about thy fathers, this old generation, and then he turns and takes his attention to this generation, the one that he's talking to on the edge of the river, getting ready to cross over. He goes, okay, that was then. They went down in Egypt. Now, you've come out of Egypt. You're preparing to cross over into this river, over this river, into the promised land. In other words, what one generation did is great, but this generation is getting ready to do something different. And you just see that. It says in verse 1, Thou therefore shalt love the Lord thy God and keep his charge and his statutes, his judgments, and his commandments always. That's what the other generation did. It's your turn. It's your turn. And so here's, here's the second hand. Here's the second main point. The first one is you're here because another generation was. Here's your second one. You're here because another generation will be. That's it. That's the whole message. You are here because there was a generation before you. They were here. Praise the Lord. I'm grateful for them. I'm grateful for the past. I'm grateful for the grandfathers. And I'm grateful for the great-great-grandfathers who poured their guts into their families. I'm, I'm thankful for pastors who stood up and preached the word when nobody else will. I'm thankful for those who made disciples. I'm thankful though for those who made sacrifices. I'm thankful for a previous generation. But it's time for this generation to step up. Why? Because there's going to be another generation. That's why. And so you're here because there's another generation to follow. There's, there's going to be another generation who will be here. And the expectation you see in verse 1 is that you own your own faith. That you take it and you run with it. It's not your dad's God. It's not your grandfather's God. It's not your pastor's God. It's yours. It's your faith. Do you own it? don't, they won't. Amen? Verse 2. And I love how Moses just puts this. I love this. He says, and know ye this day, for I speak not with your children. What did he just say? The next generation. Because I, we already talked about the fathers. And now I'm talking to you. He makes it very clear. I'm not talking to the next generation right now. I'm talking to you. And isn't it interesting how this generation, it's every generation, but how the, the current generation 
always expects the next generation to be someplace that they that we haven't even been. Jesus is calling. Verse 2. He says, Know ye this day, for I speak not with your children, which have not known, which have not seen the chastisement of the Lord your God, his greatness, his mighty hand, and his stretched out arm, his miracles, and his acts which he did in the midst of Pharaoh, under in the midst of Egypt, and the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and to all his land. And what he did unto the army of Egypt, unto their horses, unto their chariots, how he made the water of the Red Sea to overflow them as they pursued after them, how the Lord had destroyed them unto this day, and what he did unto you in the wilderness until you came into this place, and what he did unto Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, the son of Reuben, how the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up in their households and their tents and all the substance that was in their possession in the midst of all Israel, but your eyes have seen all the great acts of the Lord, which he did. You see, he just laid out a whole lot of things that the fathers didn't see either. The generation prior to that, they didn't see that stuff. It was this generation that saw it. They saw the parting of the Red Sea. They saw Pharaoh's army drowned in the Red Sea. They, they saw the earth literally open up and swallow Dathan in a, in a byron. They, they, they saw all of those things. The next generation didn't see those things. It was this generation. This generation didn't see how many lives it took to get you a, to get you your copy of the Word of God in English. This generation didn't see that. This, gen this generation doesn't know what the previous generations have seen God do. And guess what? This generation doesn't get to see what God's going to do with the next generation. But man, oh man, you get to see what God's doing in yours. And we're going to hold on to that for a moment. So he says in verse 2, and you know this day, for I speak not with your children, which have not known, verse 7, but your eyes have seen all the great acts of the Lord, which he did. So let me just encourage you with this. Don't expect someone to be where you are if they haven't been where you are. Listen, I think sometimes we hold the next generation to a standard. They haven't seen something. And we expect them to be a little further down the road. Well, listen, they don't know. They haven't seen. And it's your job to share what you see. So don't expect someone to be where you are if, you haven't, if they haven't been where you are. Because he says that this generation hasn't seen what you have. So let's just look at this quickly. He says in verse 2, which have not seen the chastisement of his greatness, his mighty hand, and his stretched out arm, and his miracles, and his acts. And then from verse 3 to 6, he lays out two examples of those things. He says, verse 7, your eyes have seen all the great acts of the Lord that you did. This generation has not seen, this, sorry, this next generation has not seen the things that you've seen. And they need, let me put it this way, they need to know, they need to know what you've seen. story time. I wish we could give everybody the bike and just come up and just give us what, man, this, this is what God did. You know, we talked about when we sold our building, 
we just stepped out in faith. We went to this other spot. We hung out there, and then we came here, and we went to the park, and now we're back here. And we've been all over the place. And our kids have just been going with the flow, haven't they? We just go where mom and dad go. That's what they do. But these kids, they're going to have some stories to tell. Oh, I remember when we sat under the, under the trees. I remember when it started raining at the end of the service. I, 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 remember, I remember bringing our bag chairs, our lawn chairs to church. I, re, I remember doing all these different things. They're going to have some great stories, aren't they? You know why? Because they're going to they're gonna understand that they followed a mom and dad and aunt and uncle or grandparent who followed the Lord. Man, do you remember when, when mom and dad stepped out in faith? Do you remember when we were part of that? Remember, I say that all the time. I think Kansas say that. We don't say remember. We say remember. Remember when? Listen. We need to share some stories. Some things that God has shown us, what God has done in our lives. First John chapter 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon of our hands and hands with the word of life. This is John, the apostle John, who spent time with Jesus and loved him and touched him and, and spoke to him and let his hand head on his, on, his, on his chest and heard the heartbeat of God. Verse 2, for that life was manifest and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, which was manifest unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we you you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father, with the Son, Jesus Christ. And he says, I want to share everything I know about Jesus so that you can have fellowship with him too. He said, I, I'm a generation, but I want to share with the, with the next generation. They didn't get to walk with Jesus. They didn't get to see his miracles, but they get to see it through John. Listen, the next generation has to hear our stories. They have to hear the stories of what we've seen God do. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 11. They need to know what you've seen God do. But guys, get this, get this, get this. They need to see God. They need to see God. How dangerous it would be for us to pour into the next generation facts. I'm going to just give you a whole lot of Bible knowledge. How dangerous it would be just to give us to give the next generation. Let me tell you some stories about some men of God. Well, it's good to give Bible knowledge. And it's good to talk about some great men of God. And we can give, we give the next generation a set of rules and, 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 and guidelines and legalistic this, legalistic that. And be careful. Because what they're going to end up seeing is they're going to end up seeing you instead of God. And we need a generation that sees God. So here's the question. What do you want the next generation to see? Because if, if you're a parent, I know this is what you, I mean, I, I would bet that this is what you want your children to see, that you want your grandchildren to see, that you want your great-grandchildren to see. If you are a Sunday school teacher, if you're a children's worker, you want them, this child to see. You want this next generation to see these things. You know what they are? God's chastisement. God's greatness. God's mighty hand, his stretched out arm, his miracles, and his acts. That's what you're going to want the next generation to see. Amen? And that's what he told them that they've seen. And I want the same thing for the next generation. Now what you see here is some Hebrew parallelism, which is, which is I just think, fantastic. So he talks about the chastisement of the Lord in verse 2. He talks about his greatness, his mighty hand, his stretched out arm, his miracles, and his acts. And then from the end of verse 3 all the way to verse 6, he gives us examples of those in reverse. He says, uh, which he did in the middle of verse 3, which he did in the midst of Israel, Egypt, unto Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and to all his land. That's the miracles of God. Remember the, the plagues, verse, verse 4. And what he did unto the army of Egypt to their horses and to their, to their chariots. That's the stretched out arm and, and, and how he made the water of the Red Sea to overflow them as they pursued after them. Sorry, sorry, as they pursued after you. That's his mighty hand. How the Lord had destroyed them unto his day. Verse 5. And what he did unto you in the wilderness until you come into this place. That's his greatness. And look at this, verse 6. And what he did to Dathan and Abiram. Remember they offered strange fire before the Lord. And, and they opened up, it opens up the, the earth and it swallows them all up. That's 
God's discipline. That's God's chastisement. You see it all there. Now listen, here's what I want the next generation to know. I want them to know that God is willing to discipline them because they're his children. Hebrews chapter 12. I want them to see God's greatness. I want them to, to experience God's mighty hand. I want them to understand what it means for God's outstretched arm. I want them to understand and see God's miracles. I want them to be enamored with God's acts. In other words, I want them to see God too. Amen? That's what I desperately want of this next generation. And so, they, yes, they need, to, they need to hear what I've seen. But, oh, my goodness, they need to see God. Now, let's wind this down. Because look at verse 8. After you've seen some things, verse 7. Verse 8. Therefore, should you keep all the commandments which I command you this day, they may be strong and go and possess the land which ye gave, which ye go to possess it, and that ye may prolong your days in the land, which the Lord swear to your fathers to give unto them and to their seed a land that floweth with milk and honey. Last thing, not only do they need to hear what you've seen, not only do they need to see God, but they need to see you seeing God. They need to see you as you see God. Everybody with me on that? Because what good is it for you to point out God to this next generation if you can't see Him? And if they don't see you seeing God, and he tells you very quickly, verse 8, keep all the commandments which I command you this day. In other words, be faithful to God's word. That means you have to read it. Did you know that? That means you have to read it. But not just read it. You have to live it. Be a walking epistle. In other words, don't let go of God's word. We live in, a, in an age where people are dumb with the word of God, left and right. Amen, church? They are, they are walking away from the word. Left and right, don't do it. Don't let go of the word. And if you don't let go of the word, the word won't let go of you. I promise. I promise. But if you make it optional, if you make reading and living the word of God out optional, the next generation will opt out. I promise. I promise. Why? Because they did not see you seeing God. Let me just close with this. He says, keep the word that you may be strong, possess the land, and prolong your days. That's, what he, that's how he closes out, eight and nine. So, they need to see you seeing God, be faithful in God's word, yes. But be what you want the next generation to be. Be what you want the next generation to be. Be strong in the Lord. Possess the land. Prolong the days. There are so many believers who are weak in their faith. And what do their children see? What do Children, what did the children of the church see? They equate our weakness with the weak God. No, we need to be strong. Don't, no, don't hear, man, I got to be strong. No, no, no. We need to be weak so that he can be strong in you. That's the case. Be strong. Be strong by relying on the Lord so that they see God, so that they understand a strong God. Then he says, possess the land. Possess the land. Because if you settle for less, I'm telling you, if you choose to settle for less, less than God's promises, less than what God has for you, if you settle for less, the next generation, you know what they hear? It's not worth it. That's what they hear. If it wasn't worth it to mom and dad, if it wasn't worth it to grandma and grandpa, if it wasn't worth it to that generation, why should it be worth it to me? possess the land. Now here's the other thing. Guys, if we don't possess the land, we are setting the next genera generation up for failure because they have to make up the ground that we didn't do. we got to possess the land and prepare the next generation, which takes me to the last thing, prolong your days. 
What does that mean? Prolong your days. Guarantee that there's still going to be a generation following. Who's going to be following the Lord after your dead and gone? Who's still going to be standing? Does your line stop with you? Let's be legitimate about that. Does your line stop with you? Had Jesus formed the disciples, and those disciples made disciples, and those disciples made disciples for 2,000 years. For 2,000 years, they made disciples. And now it's 2020. And somebody's turned you into a disciple. Praise the Lord. But does the line stop there? Or will there still be somebody standing afterwards? Does the family tree stop with you? Does it stop here? Because if, if it does, I, I got news for you. The next generation will not care about another generation. That'll be it. We're one generation away, guys. One generation away. So in chapter 10, verse 22, he says, the fathers went down to Egypt. He's talking to this brand new generation, generations afterwards. And now they've seen God do some mighty things. And now they're getting ready to cross over the river. And that's exactly what happens. They cross over the river Jordan. They go into the promised land. They take on Jericho. They take on Ai. They do all these different things. But then that generation dies. And there's a new generation that shows up on the scene. You know what the Bible says about that generation? Judges Chapter 2, verse 10. You don't need to go there. Let me just read it to you. This one will close. And also all that generation. What generation? The one we're reading about today. The one we're talking about in Deuteronomy chapter 11. That generation. And also all that generation were gathered into their fathers. And there arose another generation after them. Which knew not the Lord. Nor yet the works which he had done. There's a generation that gets all this gold and they're told what to do and they didn't do it. And the next generation did no doubt. They didn't know. I don't want to go out like that. Anybody else? I don't want to go out like that. I want to know they're still going to be Amen, church? Let's stand together. Think generationally. Think generationally. Who's still going to be standing? Metaphorically, is there anybody standing behind you right now? Metaphorically. Physically, I know some of you, this, yes, there are people standing behind you right now, but go with me, go with me here. As you're standing, who's standing behind you? Following the Lord as you follow you, as you follow the Lord. Following you as you follow you. Who? Don't let it stop. Don't let it stop. And we can't allow it to to happen again. We've got to be thinking about the next generation. And I'm loving hearing the pitter path kids run. I love it. You know why? Because that's not the future of the church. It is the church. Doesn't matter how old you are, you are the church. And I love that there's little kids running around. Amen. Because they feel at home. But I want them just running around. I want to run it all around after Jesus. And the only way they'll ever do it is if they see you seeing Jesus so that they can see Jesus and own their own faith and love him as their God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Close us out in prayer. Let me just ask. Love you guys. Father, Lord, thank you for this day and time to come together and hear your word. I thank you, Father, for the message that's been taught. I pray, Father, as parents, we would be a generation, Father, that would follow you and would, Father, live in, in what you want us to live in and, and to see you 
mighty name we stretch forth our Father in heaven to us, highest of Father, your love for us. And Father, your acts, Father, and all the things that you do. And I pray, Father, that we would be a generation that passes it on to others, uh, the next generation to see you in us, Father, that they would see your glory in their life. Just want to give you praise and glory in all things. 